Our society and world at large, I believe, has got itself into such an awful state that it is hard to envisage that it will ever be any better than it actually is. We look at our land tonight as it is, and I don't want to sound uh, overly pessimistic or melodramatic, but the reality is that in recent years, doors have been opened that it's going to be very hard and difficult to close. The spiritual, moral, and ethical landslide in our day and generation is unprecedented. We are living at a time whenever, as Isaiah said, evil is called good, and good is often referred to as evil. We are living in a time where, again, like the days of Isaiah, it seems that truth lies fallen in the streets. Isaiah 59 and verse 14, God's servant says, Judgment is turned away backward. Justice standeth afar off. Truth is fallen in the street. Equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth. And then in the background of that, it says in verse 16 of Isaiah 59, And God saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Dark and desperate days. And yet those are days like the days which we are living in. Good is called evil. Evil is called good. Truth is fallen in the street. Judgment is turned away backward, things are turned around, and equity cannot enter, and moreover, very few people are really praying earnestly about the situation. We are almost, it seems, a couple of generations beyond what has been called a post-church society, and we see consequences of that all around us. And as far as God's people are concerned, it seems that many of us are indifferent. Many of us are apathetic. Many of us are prayerless. Many of us are powerless. Many of us are filled with unbelief. And we are void of faith, void of zeal, and maybe even more than that, we are carnal and disobedient to your God and to your Savior. And I often think that if revival came, genuine heaven-sent revival came to your churches and to your lives and to your land and to your nation and to this island and to Britain as a whole, it would, it would seem that if God turned the tide around, I don't think any of us would be able to take it in at all. Things would be so radically different from what they are tonight that it would just seem to us like a dream. And we would maybe even wonder, is this really happening all around us? Like the days of the psalmist here, Psalm 126, which is a psalm of rejoicing as the exiles were returning from captivity in Babylon to their land and to their city again of Jerusalem. They sang these songs of degrees, and in Psalm 126, 1, their song goes up, When the Lord turned again, the captivity of Zion, we were like them, the dream. It just seemed to be something beyond belief what God had done for them. And I think if God came in a revival blessing, those of us who are saved, we would be like them, the dream. We would just find it very difficult to believe or even understand what God is doing because maybe we have become so accustomed to things as they are that we never envisaged that things could ever be any different. I want to speak for a little while tonight about when God turns the captivity of his people. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, we were like them that dream. I want you to notice Three simple things here tonight. First of all, a sorrowful reality. A sorrowful reality. It speaks here in this text, right in the center of the verse, about the captivity 
of Zion. And the captivity of Zion for 70 years had been a sad and a sorrowful reality. For 70 years, the children of Israel had been in captivity in Babylon. And it certainly was a reality. And it was a very sorrowful, distressing reality. They highlight it here in Psalm 137 and verse number 1, by the rivers of Babylon. There we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they, ha- they that carried us away captive required of us a song. And they that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing unto us one of the songs of Zion. And they replied, How can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? It was a sorrowful reality. They hung their harps upon the willows. That's a, a phrase that's translated even into modern-day culture, whenever someone's depressed or discouraged or downcast, they'll say, don't hang your harp upon the willows. comes from that time whenever the Israelites were captive in Babylon and they had lost their song, they had lost their joy. They were a gazing stock and a laughing stock amongst their enemies. But you know, this sorrowful reality, the captivity of Zion was justified. It was something justified. In other words, they deserved it. The sins of the children of Israel for generations had cried out for chastisement. And the land had cried out for judgment. God had sent many prophets to speak to Israel about their sin, but they tragically and sadly refused to return. Isaiah stands out as a spiritual giant in his day and in his generation. And in Isaiah chapter 1, verse number 4, Isaiah cries out the first sermon that he preaches, a sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? Why will you revolt more and more? The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint from the sole of the foot, even unto the head. There is no soundness in it, but wounds, bruises, putrefying sores that have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence." It is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage in a vineyard, as a lodge in a garden of cucumbers, as a besieged city. God raised up Isaiah to warn the people that they needed to return. They were backslidden. They needed to get right with God. And then after that, Jeremiah came along. And in Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse number 13, Jeremiah says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out them cisterns, broken cisterns that hold no water. Verse 17, Thou hast not procured this unto thyself, and that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way. Verse 19, Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee. Hosea, again, did the same. These are men that God raised up and men that God sent. In Hosea chapter 1 and verse 2, God likens his people onto a bunch of spiritual harlots or spiritual adulterers. God said to Hosea, Go, take unto thee a wife of whoredoms and the children of whoredoms, for the land hath committed great whoredom in departing from the Lord. And our land tonight has departed from the Lord. We have done the same, and sadly the churches have done the same, and maybe many of us have done the same as well. This sorrowful reality was justified. And we have noted as well that this sorrowful reality was prophesied. It seems that God never sends judgment or punishment or chastisement 
to a people without giving significant and sufficient prior warning, first of all. God always gives ample warning, and God always gives room and space to repent, and warning of the consequences of sin. He did it in the law of Moses for the children of Israel. In Leviticus 26, we read in verse 21, If ye walk contrary unto me, and will not hearken unto me, I will bring seven times more plagues upon you according to your sins. In verse 31, he says, I will make your cities waste, and I will bring your sanctuaries into desolation. In verse 33, he says, I will scatter you among the heathen, and draw out a sword after you, and your land shall be desolate, and your cities waste. In Deuteronomy, Chapter 4, he re-echoes this all over again. He says in verse number 9, Only take heed to thyself, keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget these things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them unto thy sons and daughters. And our children in our day and generation are not being taught the gospel. They're not being taught the word of God. They're being robbed of the truth of God's word. God says in Deuteronomy 4, 23, Take heed unto yourselves, lest ye forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you. Verse 27, And the Lord shall scatter you among the nations. God warned of this, prophesied of this in the law of Moses. And again, at the dedication of Solomon's temple, he spoke about a time if if the Israelites sinned, and he says, if I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, God is saying, if you sin against me, there's going to be consequences. And then, of course, he did it through the ministry of the prophets. We've already thought about Jeremiah and Isaiah and Hosea. And in Jeremiah 13 and verse number 15 through to verse number 21, God says that you're going to be carried away captive if you turn away from me. He says, if you will not hear my law, my soul shall weep in secret places for your pride, and mine eyes shall weep sore and run down with tears because the Lord's flock is carried away captive. So it shouldn't have been a surprise at all that the Israelites were now facing this sad reality, this captivity of Zion. It was justified. It was prophesied. It was no surprise because God means what he says. The warnings, friends, of God's word need to be taken seriously. And as well as that, it was also quantified. They were explicitly told that the captivity of Zion and Babylon would last for 70 years. Jeremiah 25, verse 11 and 12. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. 70 years is a lifetime, isn't it? Psalm 90, 10. The days of our years are three score years and ten. You know, whenever this COVID-19 thing hit and we were told there's going to be a three-week lockdown, that seemed like a long time. And then at the end of three weeks, there's going to be another three weeks. And now here we are about 14 or 15 weeks later. And it maybe seems like a long time. And as we look forward, we wonder, will things ever get back to normal again? But can you imagine God saying to a people, now for 70 years you're going to be scattered. For 70 years you're not going to be in Jerusalem. For 70 years you'll never see the doors of God's house opened. For 70 years there'll be no worship. For 70 years no sacrifice. For 70 years no public assembly in Jerusalem. A long time. And many would grow up knowing nothing other than captivity in Babylon. And what was strange would become completely normal to that generation. And people would live a lifetime outside of God's blessing. And it's been perhaps such a long time in our land and such a long time in our churches that we have known a move of God that this present age in which we're living, this time of dryness, deadness, 
barrenness. It seems normal to us. And it's all that some of us have ever known. And maybe we can't envisage anything other than the darkness of the day in which we're living. Sorrowful reality, the captivity of Zion. But notice, secondly, the sovereign remedy. When the Lord turned the captivity of Zion. Yes, I say sovereign because it was God and God alone that turned the captivity of the Jewish people out of Babylon. Only God could do it. And it's the same in our day as well. If this nation of ours and our churches and our society is ever going to be any different, man will not be able to do it. Denominations will not be able to do it. Politicians will not be able to do it. COVID-19 certainly won't do it. Many people said a number of weeks ago, well, this will turn people back to God. It hasn't. Only God can do it. The remedy to the situation on our day needs to be sovereign. God did it. The Jews returned to Israel under Ezra and under Nehemiah, and yet underneath and above and around it all was the sovereign hand of an almighty God. Psalm 121 says, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from whence cometh my help. Children of Israel looking towards Jerusalem, looking towards the hills, symbolic of looking towards God and looking towards heaven. They recognize that the remedy is sovereign. And if it's a sovereign remedy, it's also a supernatural remedy. The Lord, the supernatural God of heaven, Jehovah God, turned the captivity of Zion. Let us never forget that the remedy to our nation and to our churches is supernatural. It's not in some new program or in some new policy. Are people getting together and having some type of think tank or some course of some, I don't know what it might be, but everybody's talking oftentimes about employing this and doing that. And we fail to realize that the need in our lives, our hearts, our homes, our churches, and our nation is supernatural. It takes the supernatural to burst the bands of the natural. And God turning the captivity of Zion was something entirely supernatural. So often we think along natural lines. But any time God does something for His church, it's always supernatural. Because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God. And the carnal mind is enmity against God. And therefore, to some, for something to happen in natural man to turn us back to God and to deliver us and to revive us, it has to be supernatural. Supernatural. And furthermore, I believe that there are supernatural forces arrayed against the church. And there are powers that work in high places that are supernatural powers. Paul said that very clearly in, in the book of Ephesians. He said that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, and spiritual wickedness in high places. And there was a lot more to Babylon than just human enmity against Israel. There were the powers of hell and darkness in that, and yet God turned that captivity. It was something sovereign. It was something supernatural. It was something specific. He turned their captivity. It was not something imaginative. It was not something they supposed to have happened. It was not something ambiguous. It was something real. It was something definite. And it was something tangible. God did something specific. And we need God, and we need to pray tonight that God will do something specific in our day. Did you notice the little word again? When God turned again the captivity of Zion. That little word, again, is often used in Scripture in the context of revival. Psalm 85 and verse 6, Wilt thou not revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee? Psalm 80 verse 3, Turn us again 
O Lord God of hosts, cause thy face to shine. And we shall be saved. It's repeated in verse 7. It's repeated in verse 19. Psalm 126 and verse 4. Turn again our captivity, O Lord, as the streams in the south. This is something that God has done before. Did you ever study the Word of God and see just how many times God delivered His people Israel? Again and again and again and again. Did you ever take historical records of revival history books and look at times whenever God sent revival in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, in the first and second centuries, in the time of the Reformation, in the 1700s, in the 1800s, at the beginning again of the 1900s, and you look at times whenever God has sent revival, and surely we can trust God to do it again. And we need Him to do it again. This was a sovereign remedy. It was sovereign, supernatural, specific. I believe it was also sympathetic. And in saying it was sympathetic, I mean to say it was a response in the heart of God to the cry of His people. We have noticed the cry of His people in Psalm 137. It shows us just where they were. They sat down. They wept when they remembered Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? If I forget the old Jerusalem, let my right hand forget her cunning. Verse 7, Remember, O Lord, the children of Edom. Happy is he that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. They're praying for God to intervene and to stand in against their enemies. It shows us their cry in Babylon. And it is ever God's will and it is ever God's way to respond to the cry of his people whenever they are in captivity. Whenever God called Moses in Exodus chapter 3, God said in verse number 7, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them up out of the land onto a good land and a large onto a land that floweth with milk and honey. God saw, and then God heard. God knew, and God came down to bring them up and to bring them out and to bring them in. He responded to the cry of their people. You read that so many times in the book of Judges whenever the children of Israel sinned and they fell into captivity and then they cried unto God by reason of their bondage and God raised up deliverers, judges to deliver his people Israel. God has written this indelibly into his law. Deuteronomy chapter 4 and verse 29 Oh, that there was, verse 29, Deuteronomy 4, uh, speaking of God scattering his people among the nations, he says in verse 29, But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, uh, thou shalt find him, if thou seek him with all thy heart and with all thy soul. We, friends, need to cry unto God tonight with all of our hearts and with all of our souls. But how often... How often have we heard of our need for prayer? How often have we heard about our need to cry unto God? How low must God bring us as a people and as a nation before we take God seriously, his warning seriously, his invitation seriously? 30 years of bloodshed in this nation of ours tragically did not turn us back to God. And now this crisis Brexit and all that goes with that and the fear and the anxiety and the worry that's in the hearts of many hasn't caused people to turn to God. The COVID-19 crisis as well doesn't seem to have turned many people to God. What will God have to do? The violence on our streets, the threat to our society, it goes on. And yet there's a sovereign remedy to our sorrowful reality. God can do great things. But the last thing I want you to consider is the surreal reply. When the Lord turned again the captivity of Zion, how did they respond? What was their reply? Well, the psalmist says, well, we were like them that dream. It just seemed like a dream. 
It seemed so surreal. And we wondered as we were coming out of Babylon and heading back towards Israel under Ezra and under Nehemiah and then the temple was being rebuilt and the walls were being rebuilt and sacrifices were being reoffered and there was praise and there was worship and multitudes thousands and thousands were returning back to the place where God could bless them it just seemed like a dream and we just couldn't take it in at all some had lived in captivity so long it seemed normal multitudes, thousands had been born in captivity and they knew nothing else. They had maybe heard about the Passover and the reign of David and the time of the judges, times of great intervention. But most of the people knew nothing else other than captivity and bondage. It's a little bit like our land, isn't it? We have become so used to the subnormal and the abnormal, that it's normal to us. But can you imagine what it would be to live in times of revival? It would be like a dream. I've certainly never experienced it. I've never lived in in a time whenever there was a real sense of God moving. I've read about it. I've heard about it. I've listened to sermons on it. I've even tried to preach some myself. We've prayed for it. But we haven't lived in it. And what would it be to live in a revival? Mary Morrison had a little book years ago entitled, I Was Saved in Revival. Just relates her testimony how she was converted to Christ during the awakening in the Isle of Lewis around about 1949 or 1950. And that was the spiritual atmosphere that she was born into, an atmosphere of revival. And yet most of us listening to this, we have been born... Certainly, if you're my age or younger, you have been born at a time whenever the tide is far out. And some of the young people maybe listening in tonight, at least I hope you're listening in, have known nothing other than an age of secularism in our society. Whenever the abnormal and the subnormal seems normal, and that which is evil is called good, and that which is good is called evil. But what would it be like to live in times of revival? Times whenever the the very atmosphere is permeated by the reality of God's nearness. A community saturated with God, as one man put it. What would that be like? To walk down the street and to sense God everywhere. To hear people talking in in their homes or out in the street or outside our schools or in the workplace or university campuses and they're just talking about God and they're seeking God and they're reading God's Word and people are flocking to God's house to hear God's Word, to pray and to worship and living in a day in a nation like Israel in these days where multitudes and scores of thousands of people are returning unto the Lord and seeking to rebuild God's house again and to worship Him and to build the things that have been broken down and to establish God's law and God's honor in the nation again. A day whenever the worship of God is central. A day whenever God's enemies have been routed. You know, that would seem like a dream. Certainly it would be like a dream for me. And I'm sure it would be like a dream for you as well. We've never experienced it. But it's still, it's still real. Look at the emotion of the people in verses 2 through to verse 4. Then was her mouth filled with laughter. Not the laughter of unbelief that Sarah had, that This couldn't happen. Maybe they laughed like that in Babylon whenever men like Ezekiel and Daniel said, listen, we found the book of Jeremiah and Jeremiah says there's going to be a return and some of them maybe laughed. But whenever they were returning and they did return, there was a laughter of joy. It wasn't sinful unbelief, but it was a sense of, I can't believe that this is happening. We're so thrilled at what God is doing and our tongue with singing. One of the marks of revival is a, a renewed desire to worship, a liberty, a joy, and a freedom in worship. And then it says in verse 2 as well, Then said they among the heathen, The Lord hath done great things for them. Wouldn't it be wonderful to see the 
most ungodly of people looking on, the atheists, the skeptics, the agnostics, the haters of God, the false religions, to look at the church of Jesus Christ in our land, in our day and generation, and have to throw up their hands and say, listen, God has done this. We can't stand against it. We can't oppose it. We can't stop it. God has done great things for them. We didn't believe them. We didn't believe their gospel. We didn't believe their Bible. We laughed and scoffed when they talked about prayer and the power of God. But now we see it, and it's real. And they stand afar off, and we give our, our benediction to that, and we say in verse 3, yes, the Lord hath done great things for us. We're off, we are glad. All glory went to God, but the children of Israel were the benefactors. We often sing that lovely old hymn, Revive thy work, O Lord, thy mighty arm make bare. Speak with the voice that wakes the dead, and make thy people hear. But there's a verse that's not in our hymn book, and it says, Revive thy work, O Lord. Give Pentecostal showers. Be thine the glory, thine alone, and the blessing, Lord, be ours. Revival in our churches, in our experience, in our town, in our nation. Revival in Britain, as Britain currently is, a post-church society, revival would be like a dream. It's hard to believe it could happen. But friend, if this book is true, and it is, it can happen. God is the God of revival. God, any rivers you think are uncrossable, God, any mountains you can't tunnel through, God specializes in things thought impossible. He can do just what no other could do. Let's tonight give ourselves to prayer and to praying for revival. Let's pray just now. Heavenly Father, we thank Thee, Lord, for this wonderful psalm. We think of this verse, O God. We think of how relevant it is to us, Lord. We are living in days of captivity, days, O God, when the world and society and the flesh and the devil and legislators and principalities and powers want to bind the people of God. They want to stop us from living for Thee, obeying Thee, honoring Thy word, spreading the gospel. O oh God, we pray that You'll turn our captivity. Lord, maybe even after many years, many have lost faith that God can do this, but Lord, do it. Lord, rebuke us for our unbelief. Turn our captivity. Make this dream a reality. And grant, O God, tonight as we pray that thou will give us help. Here in heaven, thy dwelling place, answer prayer. We ask it for thy glory, giving thanks in the Saviour's name.